119 and Isaiah 55. Psalm 119 and Isaiah 55. And we've been talking about living in touch with reality. Living in touch with reality. There are certain realities that are not visible. There are certain realities that are forgotten by human beings. And when you don't live in touch with those realities, then you're going to struggle in life unnecessarily. But when God helps us to get in touch with reality, now we can live our lives within those realities and in congruence with those realities and be blessed. And it would be, as I've told you, like somebody who decided they're going to start driving a car and did not know that there was anything called traffic signals. Did not acknowledge stop signs and was not aware that there would be other cars on the road and not realize that these cars are very heavy and they can do damage not only to other cars, but also to lives and bodies. And if you don't live and drive in touch with reality, then you're headed for a crash. And this is the way most human beings live their lives. They live their lives based on what they see with their eyes and what they understand from their surroundings, but not based on the reality of truths that God declares that are going to affect their lives and already are affecting their lives. And so we've been talking about this now for several weeks. And I want to pick it up again and bring this word that the Lord has impressed for this week. And I'm telling you, this is a good one right here. This is a good one right here. Yeah, ha, have you ever, uh, have you ever like had ice cream and you know, some, some ice cream is not just, you know, like straight vanilla, but it's got stuff in it like chunks of chocolate or, or uh, I kind of like peanut butter and chocolate ice cream. And you know, you get a little, little hunk of peanut butter in there or some of you like strawberries, you know, and you get a little strawberry in there. Well, you know, you know, when you hit the good stuff, anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's all good, but you know when you, oh, there it is right there. There's the good stuff. This, this is the good stuff today. Are you ready for this? Oh, man. If, if you could get this message today, this is life altering. This is a game changer today. If you can grab this, I don't mean an emotional game changer. I mean, in your life, this will revolutionize the results of your life. If you can get this today. You ready? All right, I'm ready to give it to you. Here we go. Psalm 119. I want us all to read a very short verse, but it's verse 89. You know, this is the longest chapter in the Bible. Many, many good verses. But I want to look at the 89th verse, and let's read this out loud from the New King James Version, please. If you don't have the New King James Version, that's all right. There are a lot of good ones. But just for the sake of us reading it aloud, if you could follow along on the screens, we'd appreciate that. Psalm 119, verse 89, we'll probably read it a couple of times. Reading loudly and together, let's read. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Let's read it again. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now let me read it to you. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven forever O Lord your word is settled in heaven how long forever forever your word is settled your word is settled what does that mean when something is settled if somebody said well, uh, I'm being taken to court. And so you're tracking and praying for them and, and you know the court date and then you see them and then you say, hey, how did that ever turn out? And you say, oh, we settled. What does that mean? That means I don't need to go to court anymore. That means we don't have to hire any more attorneys. That means we don't have to have any more negotiations about it. Why? Settled. It's a done deal. It's all been agreed to. It is no longer negotiable. Why? It's settled. Listen to this. Forever, forever, 
Oh, Lord, your word is what? Settled. Settled in heaven. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever. No one in heaven is negotiating it. No one in heaven is saying, now I know we said, but no. No, it's settled. If he said it, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. In heaven. Notice he didn't say on earth. <laughs> it's settled where? In heaven. So there's no problem with heaven. In heaven, if the question is asked, well, are the promises true? Will God bring that to pass? Oh, yeah. Settled. That's been settled. For how long is it settled? Forever. It will never, ever, ever be negotiated again. The question will not come up in the courtroom of heaven. You know, when the Supreme Court is asked to take on a case, they make the decision whether or not they want to take on the case. The Lord says, I'm never taking up this case again. That's a settled issue. It's finalized. What I said is truth. Period. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. But where is it not settled? On the earth. We question it here. We deny it here. We doubt it here. But in heaven, no, there's no doubt. It's settled. <laughs> it's settled. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. He said what he meant and he meant what he said. Amen. Amen. Read it again with me. Ready? Go. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Say it again now, but this time I want you to say it with faith. Can you do that? Come on. I mean, just like, like God was saying it for the first time. Ready? Go. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. That's the way it is with God. He spoke things out of his mouth and he is settled and convinced that's what I intend to do. And I'm not negotiating it anymore. Now listen to Isaiah 55, 11. And let's see today if God talks out of two sides of his mouth or if he's consistent and congruent. Isaiah 55, 11, God says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. If I sent it to heal, it will heal. If I sent it to save, it will save. If I sent it to provide and to prosper, it will provide and prosper. If I sent it to release and liberate, it will release and liberate. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Do you think God's convinced? Do you think, does he sound like he's about to back off from his promises? It's like James says, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. It doesn't even look like God's ever going to change. Not even his shadow gives a hint of him changing. Amen. God said, what I spoke, I stand with no negotiation. I expected to do what I said. Period. That's good for us. I said, that's good for us. Now listen to what he said in Numbers 23, 19. He said, he's not like the person next to you. God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. Amen. Men lie. Human beings lie. 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Listen to these questions. Has he said and will he not do? Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Is it even a possibility that God has made a promise that he's not fully willing to keep? Is there even a chance that God has spoken something that he is not intending on following all the way through? No, he's not a man that he should lie. See, a problem we have is we were raised in a human society. And we, don't, we, we can't trust everybody. And we've heard a lot of words. A lot of people make promises. But God says, no, 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 I'm different than that. I, if I said it, I'm going to do it. If I've spoken it, I'm intending to make it good. That's where God stands. That's where God stands. All the promises of God are non-negotiable. They are settled in heaven. They are settled in heaven. Now listen to this. Listen to Jeremiah 1.12. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. I am ready to perform my word. I am ready to perform my word. You know, one point of unbelief that I found is so many people, because they don't see the promise coming to pass with their eyes, they begin to speak out of their mouth and say, Well, you know, it's just God's timing. It must not be God's time yet. And we will, with our unbelief, delay the miracles of God from coming to pass in our lives because we're speaking not what God said, but we're speaking what we see. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're not supposed to speak based on what we see. We're not supposed to believe based on what we see. We're supposed to speak and believe what God said in His Word. Amen. Amen. And God said, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Can you imagine somebody coming in and confessing Jesus as Lord, having heard the gospel and God says, no, I've saved enough people today. Come back tomorrow and I'll save you. <laughs> Did we ever see Jesus? Somebody came to be healed. Yes, I believe you will do this. Oh, I healed too many people today. I'm tired. Come back tomorrow and I'll heal you. Did Jesus believe that the word of God was settled in heaven? Did his ministry carry that out? Was it congruent? Was his actions, were his actions and his miracles congruent with what the Bible says about God's promises? Did he send anybody away? No. No. No, and he didn't say, no, you'll have to wait a few more days before you get your miracles. No, no, today is the accepted time. Now, there was times where Lazarus had died and Jesus delayed getting there, didn't he? Didn't he? But for the glory of God, because God wanted glory raising him from the dead. We delay so much because we begin to build doctrine on experience instead of on the Word of God. It's a settled issue. We should receive today. It may take a little while to manifest, but we receive it today. Amen? I'm telling you, this is life-changing if you can get this. This is life-changing. If you were on the freeway broken down and you called me on the phone and I said, where are you? You say, oh, hey, I'll, I know exactly where it is. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. You know what you say? Thank you. Now, why do you say thank you? Because I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. You don't know if I have a busy schedule and somebody, you know, on my way out to get in my car, somebody said, Hey, hey, don't you like barbecue? Well, let's go to lunch. I found this great barbecue place. Oh, okay, let's do that. That's great. No, you believe what I said. And so you say, thank you. See, when you believe God's word 
and realize that he's not a man that he should lie, when he says it, you say, thank you. Why? I know you will do it. It's forever settled in heaven. You're not a man that you should lie. Have you said and will you not do? Have you spoken and shall you not make it good? Amen. So shall my word be. I like what Jeremiah 1.12 says in the Amplified. It says, then said, uh, then said the Lord to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. God says, I'm watching over my word to make sure that I bring it to pass. He's supervising himself. Amen. Looking over his own shoulder. Making sure that he does what he said. He said, I'm alert. Don't think I fell asleep. I'm active. Don't think I'm complacent. And I'm watching over my word to make sure it comes to pass. See, what am I saying? What is God saying? It's settled in heaven. The only place it's not settled is here on earth. In our own hearts. But if it gets settled in our hearts, we begin to walk as if God is real. As if his word is truth. And our life aligns with his word. And then the blessings of God flow. But as long as we're in unbelief, that unbelief will stop the blessing of God. Do you remember Jesus went to Nazareth and the Bible says he couldn't do a mighty work there. Didn't say he wouldn't. It said he couldn't. He couldn't. And it goes on to say because of their unbelief. So here the power of God was stopped in its tracks, not because it wasn't available, not because God didn't want to bring it to them, but because they didn't believe it. Their own doubt stopped it. I declare over you today, your doubt is draining away. And faith is rising in your heart. And you see, here's how you know when faith gets in your heart. Attitude comes. I'm not talking about a bad attitude. I'm talking about a good attitude. Where man, something inside I said, man, I ain't living this way anymore. Man, God has made promises to me. And somebody's been stealing them. And I'm not going to allow that to happen anymore. Amen. I'm going to stop acting like God made a decision to change. Because that's a lie. Forever his word is settled in heaven. So shall his word be that goes forth from his mouth. He's not a man that he should lie. He's watching over his word to perform it. So somebody else is lying. And telling me that God's wishy-washy and changing his mind and and while i'm thinking about it they're stealing my promises well jesus said the thief does not come except to steal kill and destroy but i came that you may have life and have it more abundantly isn't that what he said we already know there's a thief but see the lie of the adversary gets you to believe that maybe god is the one holding back And then you've got no option. But the Lord today is resolving that issue in your doctrine. And letting you know he has no option to turn. His word is truth. No matter what we've experienced. We all have stories of where the promise of God did not come to pass. We all have stories. But we have to stand and say one thing we know was not the problem and that's God. He is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. Amen. And when we get that resolved and when his word is forever settled in our hearts, that's when we'll begin to see the increase of the promises of God coming to pass in our lives. Amen. Now listen to this. Hebrews six sixteen through 18 is addressing the story of Abraham when God came to Abraham and said, you're going to have a lot of kids. And the Bible says he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. Then God said, see all this land right here where all the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all the otherites live on. I'm going to give you that land and throw them out. And Abraham said, uh, how do I know you're going to do it? And God's response was, bring out the animals and I'm going to cut a covenant with you to swear in blood. 
that I'm going to keep my promises to you. So the writer of Hebrews is addressing that situation and explaining why God did that to Abraham. When Abraham said, how do I know you're going to keep your promise and give me this land? God cut a covenant. And here's why. It says in Hebrews 6, 16, for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation or comfort who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So notice this. It says in verse 16, for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In other words, the reason why people say you'll hear people say, I swear to God. I don't believe they should say that, but people do it. Why? Because God is greater than them and they're swearing by somebody higher than them. You'll hear somebody say, I swear on my mother's grave. Now that's somebody that has respect for their mother, though she's dead. That wouldn't work for me because my mom's still alive. Ain't nobody down in there. I swear. See, uh, my kids, when they were growing up, uh, I'd say, hey, guess what? Uh, we're going to Disneyland. And they might say, promise, promise. Now, why are they saying that? They want to make sure that I'm going to follow through with what I said. Isn't that right? They want an oath. If they, if they would learn about blood covenant, they might ask, can I get the knife out, dad? <laughs> we, we want some blood on this to make sure that you're going to keep this covenant. And I would say to them regularly, I don't have to promise because I said it. And that's what I mean. Because we want to teach them about God. But notice God, even though he knows he's honest and true. When Abram, who did not, he didn't have a Bible. There's nobody that could preach the word of God to him yet. And so... He says, how do I know? God says, bring out the animals. And when Abram cut those animals up, God was saying, if I break my promise, then what was done to these animals, I'll have to do to myself. I'll have to destroy myself. So God was wanting to settle it in Abraham's heart and mind that there is absolutely no way that he'll ever back off of his promises. And so it goes on in Hebrews to say, now we have two unchangeable things. We've got the promises of God and we've got a blood covenant that is guaranteeing that God's promises are true. Now we have two immutable things. That means unchangeable, unalterable things. Two unalterable, unchangeable things. Notice what it says. In which it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. And that should give us strong comfort in our hearts when we're in a battle, when it looks like, well, it doesn't look like God's going to answer the prayer. We should have strong comfort to say, wait a minute, not only do I have the promises of God, I've got a blood covenant sealing those promises. Amen. All right. Now listen to Titus 1, 2. It says God cannot lie. God cannot lie. doesn't have the ability to lie. You know, if God looked at the leaves on a tree and said, they're purple. They're purple. Somebody might say, ah, ah, see, that's a lie because they're green. Look again and you'll notice they're purple now. (laughs) Amen. When God speaks it from his mouth, it comes to pass. (laughs) Amen. Amen. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. This is the God who created the world with his words. And so when he spoke promises to you, don't think those promises are any less powerful. They have all the power in the world, but they need to be received by faith. He does not force his promises to come to pass in our lives. Listen to what Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, 
But the word of our God, what? Stands forever. Stands forever. Listen to Matthew 24, 35 from Jesus' lips. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. My words will by no means pass away. And then he said in John 10, 35, he made, he, he used this phrase. He said, the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. I, I missed this for years. He put all of the Bible together and called it not the scriptures, the scripture, the scripture, one scripture. And here's what he said. The scripture cannot be broken. Not even God can break the scripture. That's how solid it is. The scripture cannot be broken. It's already been said. It's already been settled. It's already been established. It's already been confirmed. It cannot be broken. We have something so solid that we can step up on and allow to come to pass in our lives if we could just believe it. Most believers, most church-going people, they live as if God is making daily decisions on what he'll do and what he won't do. But it's a lie. It's forever settled. God, I pray that you, I pray that you, instead of thanking him, that he's already said what he would do. Doesn't Philippians 4, 6 say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Why with thanksgiving? You're barely even asking him because you already know what he'll do. Amen. Amen. I said, amen. Amen. See what would happen if we would live with the reality that God is fully committed To bring his word to pass in our lives. There would be nobody walking out of this sanctuary discouraged. Man, we'd be dancing out of this place. Isn't that right? I mean, this whole Bible. Man, God wants to bring his promises to pass. And Peter calls them exceedingly great and precious promises. And by these, we partake of the divine nature. There would be no worries. There would be no struggle. Doesn't matter what the circumstance we say. Oh yeah, that's all right. Because we're overcomers in Christ. I'm more than a conqueror through him. If God is for me, what's up? Isn't that right? Isn't that right? See, we would have attitude. We would have attitude. Rejoicing would be coming out of us because we already know. The one who controls everything is on our side. (laughs) See, this is the difference between religion and understanding God and knowing God. The Bible says, but those who know their God shall be strong and shall do great exploits. If you know your God. Today, he's revealing himself yet again and saying, you need to know. Stand on what I said. I'm committed to this. No matter what it looked like. No matter what has happened to you in your life. Today. Today. Stand on what I said. Step up there. Step up there on the word of God. And believe. Amen. Oh, this is good. Oh, all right here. I'm not done yet. Listen to 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20. For the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy was not yes and no. Jesus was not yes and no. Jesus didn't come and teach, well, you know, sometimes God does this and sometimes he doesn't, you know, because he's a sovereign God and, you know, he just kind of knows what he's doing. And sometimes he decides, you know, to bring the promises to pass. But other times he knows something else and, and he knows in your future it'd be better if he didn't and all. No, no. Human beings teach that, but Jesus never taught like that, ever. Ever. The son of God, when he came, he wasn't yes and no. And Paul said, and Silvanus, Timothy and I, we didn't preach any yes and no doctrine. Why? Look what he said. Verse 20. For all the promises of God in him, Jesus, 
are yes. And in him, what? Amen. Amen. You know what amen means? It means let it be done. It means so be it. All the promises of God, two things. The answer is yes. Why? Well, he's already promised it. And it's settled in heaven. So therefore the answer is yes. It's already yes. Well, I hadn't even asked yet. It's already yes. It's already yes. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Anybody getting this? It's already yes. And it's already amen. What does amen mean? God says, let it be done. Lord. I'm coming to you for healing. You said in your word, you forgive all our iniquities and heal all our diseases. Yes. Let it be done. All the promises. All the promises. Yes. Yes. And let it be done. Yes. And let it be done. (laughs) See, when this, this is what changed my life many years ago. This is what cut me to the heart and rocked my world. Because I felt like such a loser. I felt like I couldn't get things going right. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness. This is a sure thing for me. There's no more chances. There's no more question about whether or not my life is going to do something. It settled all the questions. And I knew anything that he promised me in here belongs to me. And all I have to do is step up and believe it. And he will do it. That's what changed my life. That's what changed my life. And that's when I began to see the power of God coming in my life and bringing favor When I stepped up to believe it, it had said the same thing all those years before. But when the reality of his forever settled word hit my life and I knew I I can't, I can't fail. I cannot fail. I cannot be held back. I cannot live in poverty. I cannot. Why? He already said he supplies all of my needs. It's a done deal. Forever settled. Done. Done. Forever settled. I could subject myself to poverty to go do a ministry somewhere in that. But in that subjections, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. It wouldn't be long till the blessings of God start coming to that impoverished situation. Why? It's settled. Amen. See, when this grips you inside and you realize, listen, I'm not talking about Uh, being encouraged here with something that could happen. I'm talking about a reality. Whether you ever step up and believe it or not, it's reality. It's reality. Can you imagine living every day knowing that that is a reality for your life? And no matter what anybody says, like, oh, that's all right. Don't worry about that. No, no, no. I, I, it's, that's already covered. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry about that. And you just live like that. That's why Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Why? No matter what hits you, that's all right. We got, we got something to take care of it. Amen. We cannot be held back when we step up on God's word. When we step up on God's word. Well, I'm going to have to finish this next week. I still got a lot to share on this subject. And you asked too many questions today. How many of you can hear God speaking to you? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Listen, we're going to receive this today, but next week, next week, you need to be here because I got to, I got to conclude this. We're talking about the reality of the forever settled word of God. Living with that reality. That's what will alter your life. That's what will alter your life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You have been listening to Pastor Jerry Dearman, founder and senior pastor of The Rock, a multi-congregation church originating in Anaheim, California. For audio 